Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. So for today's event, we will be discussing the global food system and how it relates to our health. My name is Cameron and I'm the Director of Food Justice at the Student Sustainability Collective. So um, let's welcome our presenter. Um, our, our guest speaker today is Professor Leslie Lewis. She is a USP professor here at UCSD and is the Director of Urban Health and Equity Initiatives in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, um, as well as the co-director of the Life Course Scholars Program. So she will be giving a short presentation and then after we'll, we will be having a short Q&A section. So thank you to Professor Lewis for joining us today and I'll hand it off to her now. All right, and let's see if I do indeed have, you have to stop screen sharing maybe, or maybe not. Oh, no, I get to have power. All right. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's nice to virtually see you all. Someday soon, hopefully we will see each other in person. Um, all right, so I'm gonna try to squeeze this into about 20 minutes so that we have a, you know, a conversation is probably more interesting, but I also, uh, I tend to have too much to say. So if we need to stop me, that's okay. I think, again, the conversation will be richer. So we'll just talk a little bit about what is, you know, what is uh, our global industrialized food system? What are its characteristics? What are its, um, its many costs? Because it has many. And then um, hopefully we'll have time to talk about ways we can uh, intervene to improve individual and population and planetary health. So, uh, you know, you guys know, I think this is a working group that's about food and food justice. So you guys already know, you know, a, a food system, you know, we're talking about production and processing and transport and, and consumption and all the kinds of things that have to happen to make food go where it needs to go. Um, a global industrialized food system, which is what we have um, for, for lots of people in the world. There are still people who pretty much grow food locally and eat locally, but certainly for our purposes, most of what food we get, I mean, it travels an average of 1500 miles. That's usually the stat that's used. It's, um, you know, that we could get any food at any time. Um, and so it has huge uh, costs in terms of transport. And it's also, um, as we'll talk about, heavily kind of monoculture and, um, you know, um, what else, just high inputs. So we'll get into that. So we've moved uh, in this country from really being a, a country of uh, small sort of farmers, small farm farmers, 90% um, of the population farmed. Today, less than 2% uh, percent of the population farms and, and feeds us all. Um, although we do, uh, we do get some food from other countries, we're also an exporter. Um, but we've shifted from it taking a lot of energy, human energy to produce food to not taking very much human energy at all, but taking huge uh, fossil fuel energy, which we don't typically account for. Um, so we uh, imagine ourselves to be much more efficient than we are. Um, we've seen over the past 70, 80 years, you know, this, uh, it, it's a real sort of um, celebration of technology and there are many good things with technology. Um, something called the Green Revolution was started in the 1940s to the 1970s. And basically it was this idea of how do we use technology to improve our food production, right? Let's become more efficient. Let's, let's use uh, energy to the extent that we can. And, and that's not just let's use machinery on, on bigger and bigger farms, but also let's Let's, let's create synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and lots of inputs. Um, and there's, I suppose, debate about how beneficial it, it has been. There have been a lot of costs um, and a lot of critiques, and I think they're fair critiques. The benefits of it have certainly not been distributed equally, arguably, um, it has caused more and more of the gap between the rich and poor uh, across the world. Um, it has it had actually a negative impact on, on, on gender equity. There was already a problem with gender inequity and um, in a lot of cases, um, you know, shifts in, in, in countries like India, for example, where women had control over uh, farming and that gave them some power, they lost that. And so it had a negative impact. And then the environmental impact is huge and, and we'll get into some of that. And of course, our, how the health of our environment, we are, we are integrally related to our environment. So 
Um, so it, here's this, you know, global industrialized food system and, you know, we're supposed to be using technology to feed everybody and it turns out we're not doing a very good job of that. Um, we still have 800 million people without access to enough uh, food to even really to, to, to grow up in normal ways, right? Um, and then another 2 billion people lacking micronutrients um, and that that that's devastating it's sort of a hidden hunter so there's this there's malnourishment and we also have malnourished people who are overfed in fact they have enough calories um, because what we've gotten good at is is creating foods that are high in calories and fats and sugars and salts and they taste good they appeal to us but they do not really they don't feed us in the ways that we need they're not giving us the nutrients we need so you know, if you, if you sort of add everything up, we're nearly 5 billion people who are undernourished or malnourished in our, in our world. And we've got about seven and a half billion. So that's, that's pretty bad. It's not something I would say is a success. Um, and really importantly, our industrial agricultural system really exceeds our, our planet's natural limits. We act as though we live in this open system and we can just put as much waste into it as we want and use as much energies we want. Um, and in the US, we are particularly um, bad global citizens. You know, we produce about 30% of the world's waste, even though we're less than 5% of the population, we use about 30% of that of the world's energy. Um, food production is responsible for 21 to 30%. I've even seen higher estimates, but but a huge input on, on greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a, a big contributor to, um, the, to the climate crisis as well. And um, we've shifted from um, eating as a, as a species, many, 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 many species of, of uh, many different plant species. Um, and we've shifted to uh, fewer and fewer and fewer. And in fact, in the United States, again, we're, we're, we're you know, having the worst stats of all of the possible uh, kinds of food available in the world, uh, Americans eat about 2% of the, of the potential things that we could eat. <laughs> Most of our food is elaborate configurations of soy and, and corn and, and other kinds of subsidized grains. So, you know, what is, what are the characteristics of, of this kind of a, of a food system? Um, intensive, it's large scale. We've shifted again from lots of small farms to buying out those small farms, huge corporate entities um, that are that become, you know, very powerful because they then have political power and economic power, which of course in this country are really linked. Um, lots of inputs, uh, lots of fertilizers, um, way more synthetic fertilizers than can even be absorbed in the soil. So then we end up having a runoff as well, as we'll see. Huge inputs of pesticides, which you sort of need because when you go to monocultures, you 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 are much more vulnerable to pests and diseases, and so then you have to have these this this response that then creates its own problems, and so we we create a lot a lot of problems, and not just pesticides, but herbicides, fungicides, um, and in fact, some of the the very seeds we're creating now have pesticides built into them, right? So they are themselves registered pesticides, like the BT corn. Um, and then huge machinery, obviously, when you get bigger and bigger and bigger, it is impossible for uh, human beings to do this kind of work. So you need to put a human being into uh, those massive kinds of uh, turbine, combine, uh, you know, these things that can go knock down um, and harvest uh, huge amounts. Um, oh, and I think this was this stat, what do I have? Um, in India, prior to uh, the Green Revolution, there were about 30,000 rice varieties, and today there's only 10. So massive hit to our, our biodiversity. Um, livestock, gosh, livestock itself uh, accounts for about 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions, and that is more than cars, trains, and planes combined. So just our eating of animals um, and, and using of animal products. Um, so there's a huge environmental and climate hit. There's also a huge, I don't know whether you want to call it humanitarian or just sort of like the hit to the animals and, and also to workers in the system. So what this looks like with um, animals, you know, we, it, they're consolidated and the, the model is now how many animals can we get into smaller and smaller areas to be efficient. Um, we, animals used to be in farms, part of an ecological system of the farm and you use the, their, you know, their, their waste as fertilizer. Um, chickens would, you know, take care of a lot of the pests because they would eat them. And so it was, it was a better system. And now what we've done is We've, uh, you know, they'll have their early life maybe on a farm, but then they're quickly taken to, um, you know, concentrated uh, animal feeding operations. 
where then all of a sudden we have, uh, their waste is no longer a resource, it just becomes a problem. And so um, now the idea with CAFOs uh, is that they are supposed to be more efficient. So we have as many, I mean, we're hundreds of thousands of, of cattle that we, we put into these and they squeeze them together uh, in ways that these animals are not you know, used to living and we feed them foods that they're not used to eating. And so then of course there are health problems. And then so to deal with that, we blast them with antibiotics. I think it's the stat is something like 80% of antibiotics in, that are in use are used on our livestock. And that's typically prophylactically. So it's not even, oh, they're sick, let's give them antibiotics. It's, uh, we know they are going to get sick because this context we put them in is impossible for them to live in in any kind of healthy way. So, um, and, it, and it helps them, you know, we do that to feed them so they get fat quickly and so that we can um, sell them. So we, we don't raise animals, we, we grow meat, right? These are, and that raises all kinds, for me anyway, of ethical questions about, you know, who are we to be able to do this to other um, creatures? So um, also again, huge power with these, uh, for these corporations, um, especially as they buy out more and more uh, of smaller operations. Um, so there's obviously hit to human, uh, to animal health, human health as well, because you put all those antibiotics in the, in the animals and those end up coming uh, into the food that we eat if we eat that food. Uh, communities that are around those, those CAFOs are, uh, are negatively affected. Um, there's been research that's looked at you know, the, the fumes and, and what comes out and what's in, what is in the air around us. Um, workers are uh, extremely harmed who are working in these, and these are typically really vulnerable um, people, oftentimes undocumented, um, afraid to say anything, and you know, low-paid, um, high-risk, um, very you know, uh, unsafe working conditions. Often, uh, same with. Same with these are these are hard photos to look at, but you know, squeezing um, animals into tiny. Um, you know, confined areas, um, mother pigs, you know, set, putting them up so that they can barely, you know, nurse their babies and be mothers because these are mammals. We all want to mother our, our, our babies. Um, so it is, it is really cruel. Um, and then of course, the, the amount of uh, animal waste that gets generated in these ways, again, not part of the ecological system, and massive amounts. I mean, five tons of animal waste for every person in the United States. Um, it is insane. And it's also not, it doesn't have to be held to the same standard as human waste. And so what they do is they put them in these lagoons and those sometimes spill off into um, you know farms that are down the way, which is why we have these outbreaks of, of different kinds of um, uh, like E. coli outbreaks in strawberries or spinach or, or those kinds of things, or sometimes it gets into our, our, our water system. Chickens also, and, and also genetically mod modified so that they can grow faster, right? So you go from an, in a 50 year span, um, chickens growing in half the time and becoming twice the size. So, so large and so fast that, they are, that their legs can't even support them. They can only walk a few steps to, to be able to, to get somewhere. It's, it's absolutely horrific. And, you know, singeing off or cutting off their beaks without any kind of painkillers, just boom. And, and, you know, and, and the males actually sent off when, you're, when you've got the, the layers, you've got layers and fryers. And so the layers are the ones that are gonna produce our eggs for our egg industry, they'll just have the little chicks coming out of their eggs and in the quick check. And if it's a male, it's summarily sent to its death. And, um, you know, females are sent off to a horrible short life. So, and these systems are driven by consumers and policy and all kinds of things, but we consumers certainly um, play a role. Americans eat on average over 200 pounds of meat per year. Um, meat and that is both because we are socialized to eat a lot of meat and because meat, you know, I mean, there are tasty things about meat. Um, meat is also very cheap. So we make it easy for people to get used to eating meat sometimes three times a day. Um, and sometimes it's the meat that, you know, if you're low income, you work in two jobs and you can go get a burger for a dollar. They're just, it, it makes all kinds of immediate economic sense and it fills your belly. Um, because we do not include in the cost of our meat all of the externalized costs, right? And so those are, they're called negative externalities, all kinds of ecological impacts, um, you know, air pollution, uh, runoff from the fertilizers, um, industrial waste, 
um, you know, noise pollution and actually um, air pollution from the, the transport. Um, so, and methane emissions when you're talking about all these cattle. Um, so these are, these are huge. And when you take those into account, we lose all of the efficiencies that we think we have. Um, already talked about, you know, the harms to the, to the workers. It's not a living wage. Uh, the benefits are very low. And again, often occupational hazards, which nobody calls anybody else on, and you don't, we don't have enough um, funding to, uh, to our agencies to even go and be able to check um, the, the different um, work settings, uh, you know, frequently enough. Um, there's also, you know, because it's this growing and growing industry, and in, and in fact, we have not only are we in the U.S. big eaters of animal products, that has been, it's, you know, in many ways, meat is a marker of uh, economic advancement. And so then you see more and more people um, in China and India, places that, that maybe less people ate meat. Um, so now uh, more people can eat meat. Uh, Brazil is huge. Argentina is a massive consumer. You know, there's a lot of countries that are really big consumers. Um, but in order to meet that demand, uh, we create more and more, um, you know, grazing land, uh, you know, some to some extent farmland, and that takes away critical uh, rainforests, you know, 136 million rainforest acres have been cleared for animal agriculture. Um, so our forests are like our lungs, right? Um, so is our ocean, um, which we are overfishing. Um, and so what we're doing is we're taking away and also the, the, it, it both uh, gives us oxygen and it is a carbon sink. So what we're doing is taking away our carbon sinks by, by burning down our forests um, and also increasing the amount of, of um, greenhouse gases that we are emitting into the environment. So we're, we're harming ourselves on both ends. So um, yeah, just, you know, soil erosion, I didn't even talk about, um, you know, because we're using, we're, we're not doing practices that we used to do, which is where you, you let fields lay fallow or you plant it with um, uh, crops that will re-nourish the soil because uh, the health of our food is linked to the health of our soil. And what we have done is depleted our soil profoundly. Um, and, and then as the years go by, we think, oh, we'll just keep having to throw more um, fertilizer at it. Well, fertilizer, um, you know, it, it has some of the macronutrients that foods need, but it does not have the micronutrients that foods need. So you have lots of nitrogen, for example, and you, you, know, you can get things to grow, um, but actually the nutrition of our food has gone down um, uh, over over the years. I think I might have a, a slide on that. So I've got a cat that's trying to get in. <laughs> She's like, why not right now? So, you know, there's so there's a link between our, 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 our food system and the climate and it goes both ways. You know, we both produce more greenhouse gases because of the ways that we uh, farm and, and raise our food. Um, and then the, you know, then we have uh, greater storms and, uh, you know, the impacts of our climate crisis then um, uh, impacts our food. Another area is that while we have more, um, we have so much more carbon in the air, um, some people sort of optimistically thought, well, maybe that means we're going to be able to grow more food, you know, with carbon's good for food. And what happens is food will tend to grow faster, but it's less nutritious. Um, and it also, there's some research that shows that it has higher sugar content, which is a concern for, um, yeah, we also have an epidemic of, of diabetes. Um, so lots of problems. Um, our also, our, our agricultural system is a massive uh, user of our, of our water. Um, and I'm sure you've heard some of the stats, like how it's like 600 gallons to, to basically get a, a hamburger to your mouth. Um, it's just a huge, huge water user. Runoff from the CAFOs talked about that. Um, runoff from the nitrogen fertilizers. So that all runs off into the to the rivers. The rivers then go to the ocean. And so what we have now are um, some a dead zone, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico. That's the size of Connecticut. And that basically is where um, there's nothing can live, right? Because it's so choked off, the nitrogen sort of takes uh, takes up all the space so that there can't be oxygen in the in the water. Um, and, and the hard thing is there is sort of a, this treadmill effect. And this, is, this goes to this issue of how are we gonna change things, right? Um, it is not a simple thing. Well, let's just stop that. We, we have uh, created a situation where um, we keep needing more to, to try to, or we think we keep needing more to kind of solve the, the problem that we have created. The soil actually becomes dependent. And so it, it does take some years to uh, 
to help the soil recover. And it's not impossible. There are lots of pilot programs doing this and I'll get to some, some research, research that shows that actually we can shift to organic uh, agriculture. And sometimes you have to do sort of an integrated pest management uh, strategy in between, but it is possible and it's been shown to be. Uh, so other aspects of our system, you know, we've got food delivery, long distance shipping. I already mentioned, it's like, you know, there's some debate about how real this is, but we know we ship our food a long way. Um, and it's something else we can think about. You know, I think we often think, well, I need to give up meat. That's it. And uh, but you could also think about how far did this banana come? You know, how what 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 are all the foods I'm eating and how far are they coming? And is it you know, are they fairly grown and, and are people fairly compensated? And, and what's the hit of all of it? Right. Um, a lot of our food processed, um, you know, um, packaged, I think I might have, oh, I mentioned the diminished quality of food. Uh, there's been research that's looked at how much less our, our how, how fewer nutrients our food has, um, you know, and sometimes as shocking as you take tuna and the amount of uh, vitamin A and B and all these kinds of vitamins that are in it. And by the time it gets into a can, it's, it's lost almost all of it. Uh, and then, <laughs> we also create vast amounts of waste. So globally, about 30% of food is wasted, which is a huge problem. A lot of that waste is actually pre-production. It's, it's, it's has to do with um, distribution and transport. How do we get food to people? In the United States, it's even worse. 40% of the food, of our food we waste. And a lot of, most of that is post-production. In other words, I go to the store, I buy too much, um, and I, it sits in my refrigerator and then I end up throwing it away. And um, our food waste is a massive, massive contributor to um, greenhouse gases, right? If you, if you were to, to count it as a country, it, it would be number two. That's a huge problem. All right, already mentioned, uh, you know, we've got, you know, monoculture, less varieties, which is a problem. And we know that like you can look at um, actually even the shift to agriculture for human beings 10,000 years ago, you can look at human beings that are in the area 2000 year before, years before when you had foragers and they were eating much more varied diet. And, um, and what happens when you get agriculture is um, it enables some good things, right? People can sort of stay still and you can get specialization, all these kinds of things, but you lose huge nutrients because people eat a, a smaller range of foods. Um, they know that uh, foragers uh, were taller. They had less disease. They were just healthier. And so, um, you know, you, we already sort of had some losses in the, in the kind of uh, exchange that comes with just uh, settling down with agriculture. And then now with this shift to um, this industrialized kind of high processed foods, it's, um, it's a big problem for our health. Small farmers um, squeezed out, already mentioned farm workers are harmed, uh, farm workers processing plant people, and they tend to be the uh, same folks who are vulnerable already. Um, GMOs are an interesting, you know, that's is controversial, um, but I would think that we could at least agree that there should be at least transparency in labeling so that people can make their own decisions and, and you know, seek what they, but there's huge pushback on that as well. Um, this is just more about workers, um, huge, uh, you know, there've been reports, uh, done, uh, about, um, you know, um, the systematic violations of, of human rights within the slaughterhouses and processing plants. Um, so that is a, um, a huge problem. And then even the, the few inspectors that managed to go out there, uh, because we because we have these problems with you know cramming animals together, and and um, and our answer to that is well let's douse them with chemicals when they're being slaughtered and, and processed. Um, you have things like antimicrobials that people are exposed to, and so even inspectors going there, there's been a number of, um, of inspectors who have gotten serious um, health problems just from that. And then you can think, huh, what about the workers? They are in there day in and day out, right? And then just ordinary folks eating this food. Uh, this is little, little sort of publicized fact that about a quarter of Americans become ill from foodborne illness every year. So they get food poisoning and that's from, that's from our food. And, um, only 5,000 die from it, but, um, but it's still, it's something that is surprising to people because we usually think, well, of all things, we're this wealthy, industrialized, democratic country, we should at least, we have agencies that check our food, right? <laughs> and um, it turns out that we have quite a problem with um, just basic food safety. And then pesticide exposure, and we're talking both about 
foods that we eat and it gets on our food and our hands and we ingest it. So that's one issue, but even more intensely, we're talking about the people who are handling our food and many of whom are parents and they go home to children and it passes on to them. And so there's you know, been studies looking at um, you know, rates of ADHD and diabetes and other kinds of problems in children of farm workers and they're much higher. Um, you know, the, the, these pesticides are, they're absolutely poisonous. They're neurotoxins, they're carcinogenic. Um, and often people that are spreading it or in, in the line of fire of it. I mean, there's you know, been awful cases where people are working out in the fields and the plane will come over and drop pesticides directly on them. There's just not enough sort of enforcement um, of these kinds of things. And this is just some of the research that pesticide exposure has been linked to birth defects, childhood brain cancer, but also, you know, it bioaccumulates. And so in, in people who are older, Parkinson's and, um, and other kinds of problems. So, um, also there's additional chemicals from packaging um, that often doesn't get talked about. A lot of, in, in cans, there's a lot of phthalates. Um, this is an endocrine, endocrine disrupting uh, chemical so that has implications for our reproductive system. Um, talk about in my classes that there, there's been like a, there's been a dramatic reduction in the amount of, um, uh, in the sperm count of men in the US and the motility of their sperm, 50% drop in the last 50 years. And then in the meantime, girls uh, are reaching puberty much younger. Um, and this is because these chemicals, they mimic estrogens. So basically it has this feminizing effect on both girls and boys. Um, so a big problem. So, you know, big costs, right? We, we, we have cheap uh, nutrient poor food um, and really uh, we imagine ourselves doing well if we can fill our bellies, but, but there's huge costs to individual health, population health. And of course this is inequitably distributed, right? So the poorer you are, the, the, the less access you have to the healthier foods, the whole foods, right? That, that, you know, should be renamed whole paycheck because it's, it's so expensive and it shouldn't be. And that has to do with what we subsidize, what we decide we're gonna make cheap, um, but hits to the environment, hits to community health, hits to climate health. Whoa, what did I do? Oh, sorry, okay. Okay, there we go. So what to do and um, Cameron, where am I? How much, do I, about five more minutes? Yes, um, okay, okay. perfect. Okay. So, you know, what to do about all this? And I think that, again, the, I think our conversation will be much richer, but I can share with you, you know, some things that I've talked about in my classes, because we talk about this. I think in any time, anytime you're trying to tackle a major issue like oh, our global food system, it has to have multiple level interventions, right? And, and, and we have to think about, we have to think in terms of systems because I think what we have tended to do, not just with this problem, but with lots of problems is, let me, you know, like this problem, as I said, has a lot of different um, costs or problems that are generated from it. But say you take the, um, you know, the 25% the of Americans that get these uh, foodborne illnesses. So what's our answer to that? Because what, you know, that'll be linked to, you know, kids will die, they eat a burger and they die and that's big news. And then all of a sudden there's lots of energy and we have to do something about it. And so then we do stuff like, well, we need a new standard for how long burgers are cooked so that you can kill the, you know, the bacteria that might be in that, that burger. Okay, that sounds good. And so that's the sort of like, here's this point right before, you know, people eat it that we need to address it. Or you think, well, let's back up a little bit um, let's look in our processing. We need to, and this is what we have done, let's irradiate the meat, right? Or let's add um, an, an ammonia bath so that we get rid of some of that bacteria. Take away for the moment how disgusting it sounds that you're going to eat something that has been irradiated and bathed in ammonia and then you know, cooked until nothing is left of, of nutrient, you know, of value in it. We don't think uh, systemically, like why do we have these problems? Why do we have E. coli and other kinds of bacteria that end up in our, our meat, for example? And that, of course, has to do with how we raise our animals slash raise our meat, you know, the CAFOs. And, 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 and so we need to think systemically. Um, but it also helps, I think, to break things down for people. What can I do individually? Um, certainly, there's very, very good evidence that shifting to a plant-based diet um, and sourcing that as locally as possible and as organically as possible, of course, recognizing that Lots of people can't afford to eat organic food. This is an ideal, but it is also something to, to, to sort of aim for while also 
fighting for uh, change at policy levels and, and systemic levels so that we can make something like this available, affordable, far more farmers markets available, um, you know, double up uh, EBT so that people who on lower incomes can purchase things at farmers markets. Um, Lancet Commission invited a bunch of scientists together from a bunch of different countries and they and basically said what would the best diet be and they agreed it would be this kind of diet it would be a diet that is largely plant based doesn't mean that you have to eliminate all uh, animal foods but you you really do reduce it significantly and and the truth is I know I have a vegan daughter who wants everybody to become a vegan and then I say well I think that it's much more uh, a realistic goal to, to say um, for those who can be vegan that's wonderful um, but frankly if we could get the country to drop their meat consumption and animal you know based food consumption by 20 30 40 percent, that would be profound. The impact of that would be profound. Um, and just increasing the amount of fruits and vegetables, um, because I think that I think like only 2% of our, uh, of our uh, land area, of our farming land is used for fruits and vegetables. So we could, we could really do a better job there. Um, I've asked students before, what are some different strategies? And they come up with great ideas. Um, Cameron, this is from uh, our fall class, you know, you, you think about this, and this is that systemic thinking. It, you, know, you can't just sort of change something over here. We have to think about, well, how do we think about education and how do we integrate education with, with food um, and still eating uh, good eating habits early? Well, how do you do that? Well, having school gardens, for example, is a great way. Kids, when they see food growing, they're interested. If, if they harvest the food, they want it to, to be in their lunch. Um, Connect it with, you know, connect it with education, with employment, with labor rights, with, uh, you know, farmers' rights. I mean, the average uh, take-home salary for farmers in this country um, is like eighteen thousand dollars. I mean, it's not a living wage, and so. Um, supporting local farms with, and with CSAs and the local farm to table kind of stuff, um, and all the way up to uh, shaping, you know policy so that we can regulate industries so that we can choose what are we subsidizing so you want to incentivize things we want and you want to put barriers uh, to, to things that are that we know are not good um, and yeah again rights based approaches uh, fighting for a living wage for people so that they can afford food right so at the same time you're trying to make uh, nourishing food affordable you also want to help people to have their basic needs met and to be able to have a living wage um, and to be safe on the job for, with the labor rights right uh, already talked about what we, we currently do. You know, we we don't look at the systems. We 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 tend to kind of um, have medical answers like, oh, do we have uh, lots of people with diabetes and and you know struggling with uh, you know weight gain and all these kinds of things? Well, let's let's uh, throw drugs at it or, or surgical interventions, and that's assuming, of course, people even have access to. Uh, healthcare, right? So uh, millions of people in our country do not. And then we'll think, oh, well, prevention approaches, we tend to think individual determinants of health, like if people would just eat better, if they would just exercise without taking into account all of the contextual factors. Um, so should I pause here and just turn it, uh, Cameron? I, uh, yeah, let's do that. Sharing. Perfect. Um, let me share my screen. Um, well, thank you so much for that really informative presentation. Um, I think I was reminded of, of a lot of the things that I learned um, in your class, and I'm still like really surprised that all those stats, um, especially about like 5 billion people are still undernourished, given like all the technology and innovation that we've had. And also another stat that really surprised me was that we in the US, we only eat 2% of all the things we can eat. I did yeah. not realize that it was that um, like talking. such a small fraction amount of oh my gosh I'm so we can eat like <laughs> that's just insane. Um, so now we will be having like a short Q and A section. Um, any any of the participants or like y'all can raise your hand and then if you have a question or comment for Professor Lewis, um, this will be about ten minutes. So does anyone have a question? I can also start. Or you can just unmute yourself. Okay, I think Stephanie has, uh, Stephanie can go first. Yeah, so I just had a really quick question. I don't know if you've seen, but because of 
the amount of pesticides that are used in like fruits and vegetables people especially on social media have been saying like oh you know you have to wash it with like baking soda or apple cider vinegar so I just want to know like hmm. is that helpful like is that useless like does like does that work I, you know what, it's a good question. I don't know. I have not tried that. Um, it might be that it cuts some of it. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't, it wouldn't harm because neither of those things would be harmful. Um, so I don't know if anybody has read any research on this um, in, in the group here. I don't know offhand, but again, one of those things that eh, there's no harm and maybe it does help. <laughs> uh, Felix. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, meat is like very cheap. Mm. Um, and it's to my understanding that this is because um, uh, there's huge corn subsidies in the US. Mm. Um, so they're usually being fed this kind of unnatural diet of like corn and, you know, these subsidized crops. Um, how much do you think uh, if we were to eliminate corn subsidies, for example, mm. um, how would that affect the price of meat? And do you think that will, um, like, how will that change sort of the diet or the culture of eating meat in the U.S.? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I always think we can't just do the one thing because what we have is a situation of massive economic insecurity in this country. And so you have people who need to rely on whatever food that they can get right now. Um, so you would have to, if you're going to sort of, um, you know, decrease subsidies to corn, it would have to be connected to um, increasing subsidies for other kinds of foods that are healthier for people. Um, you know, making sure that you, you find policy interventions that can support people to be able to get healthy foods, right? Um, so alone, I don't think it would be um, enough and it would, you know, could potentially be harmful. But I mean, ultimately the idea would be, right, if you in that one get, see, there's a lot of externalized costs that are not accounted for in the, in the cost of that dollar burger. Um, taking away the corn subsidy would probably bring up the cost some, um, but we would have to account for like, what if we in all of our foods uh, accounted for the climate impact or the impact to local communities health? You know, what if we were honest about that? Uh, it would that it would change our, our eating quite a bit. But again, you, I, I'm always leery of just making things more expensive for people because we already know what happens with that, which is that uh, people who already don't have enough are disproportionately harmed and people with lots of money can just sort of do their work around. That's no problem. Samantha. Yes, hi. Uh, nice to meet you. You too. Loved your presentation. Uh, I thought it was very interesting when you were talking about the farmers and how we really reduced um, local farming or, you know, that work for farmers because they're being bought out by these huge um, corporations. And that's something that I found out recently myself while researching mega dairies and the dairy industry. Mm -hmm. And so that leads into my question. I found out that the government is subsidizing heavily the dairy industry because it's a dying industry and because a lot of people are switching to more plant-based milks. And so they're buying all of, the government is buying all of the, the milk and making it into cheese and storing it in these, you know, kind of bunkers so that it doesn't go bad. So people, we see now people like that is happening because people are buying, you know, plant-based milks. I don't, I don't know. How would you think of attacking that systematically? Like, because we're obviously showing uh, consumer demand, right, to not have this dairy product, but the government is still subsidizing the the dying industry. So I don't know. Maybe. If you yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, about this, um, you've heard of the, maybe the concept of a just transition. I sort of see a parallel with the, you know, the, the climate crisis. Like how do we, we can't just sort of say, sorry, all you miners and, and all the people who work in the fossil fuel, you know, industries and just say, sorry, good luck to you. We're shifting to this. You have to figure out a way <laughs> to, to um, retrain, you know, build in like a 10, 15 year plan where people are retrained in new careers, where you support them to, to shift. Meanwhile, um, you know, yes, do more subsidies to uh, renewable approaches. And I, and the same in this space, um, if the government just continues <laughs> taking the surplus milk and making government cheese out of it, like that, that won't change, you know, 
you got to do that a little. Meanwhile, um, maybe we think about, all right, if, um, you know, maybe that we're as a society shifting toward these plant-based, based, you know, they don't even want to call them milk because this is, there's, there's a whole controversy about this kind of stuff, right? Um, but, you know, how can we help some of the dairies to, to start to do different things um, so that um, they can be viable or shift to something else and, and we adapt to the kind of changes we're gonna need to make because we really are gonna need to become more uh, plant-based uh, diet, not just for, I mean, for so many reasons, as I've said. Thank you. Yeah. I actually had a question. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know what your take is on how like COVID has affected the food system. Um, I know it has affected, especially on um, like essential workers, like farm workers are essential workers. And I feel like we're really relying on them to um, yeah, supply food during this really hard time. And it's like really not fair to them that they no, have no. to go through all of this. And they're definitely, there's definitely not um, as much support to them. And I feel like they're just now being recognized as like really essential to like everyone's well-being. Absolutely. I mean, that's what it is. All this like, oh, the heroes. I mean, this, I mean, absolutely true. And also what a, you know, this is such a, an empty praise when we're not doing anything to take care of people, right? People who are the essential workers for the most part are people who are uh, lowest paid, um, you know, doing all this critical work, making sure we have food um, and we, you know, lots of them don't have um, health insurance and they don't have, they're not earning enough money that they can, you know, feed their own families. Um, so, I mean, I think there, of course, have been sort of extreme instances where um, in other parts of the world where the, it, it hit so hard that people were not able to kind of, um, you know, harvest. Here, I mean, I think more I see like COVID has, has revealed or amplified already existing um, inequities and harms and suffering, right? We just, I, the, I forget, I, I lost count when they, they were keeping track of how much the billionaires were up to. I, I think it's over a trillion now that they have made in the last 10 months. And meanwhile, just about everybody in my sphere is just struggling and just barely making it. And um, you know, I, I have a class on homelessness and there's just, there's just, it's so morally repugnant that we uh, allow this continu to continue. Um, so basically, yeah, what has happened is that we're, you know, um, people who are already struggling are suffering more and um, people at a certain income and wealth level are so well buffered that although this is an annoyance, um, it's really not much of a, an impact. Um, we haven't seen, you know, like food prices skyrocket yet. So we've managed and largely due to these people who are saving us, uh, you know, um, so we're, we're continuing, um, but I sure would like to see um, <laughs> not just $600. First of all, a, a true kind of a, you know, some kind of a regular supports. And that would be specifically um, focusing on people who are keeping us afloat during this time, yeah. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. Um, oh, Felix? Yeah, Felix. Hi. Um, so you were mentioning earlier um, uh, um, sort of like this debate around the food system, or I I sort of hear that the debate around food system, food system is like regarded as sort of an elitist debate mm -hmm. or an, an elitist sort of topic. Um, because like you were saying, most people just um, don't have time or energy or resources to really care if their food is, um, you know, organic or, or you know, they sort of can't afford these things and, and they're, they're forced to, um, you know, consume a cheaper, the cheapest product. Um, so would you say that the change in our food system really begins with providing um, everyone in this country with a livable wage or, or like reducing the wealth inequality um, so people can actually be healthy and be in the right state of like of living like to care about these issues mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, various strategies to, uh, to um, decrease these inequities, are, that's a part of literally any public health strategy I, I you know, that, that I would ever propose. So there's always this economic intervention. I mean, and that's everything, like, I think public health interventions are like tax leveling policies and housing, you know, policies and all of these kinds of ways that we can and help people to be able to, to, to live a decent life. Um, but also, like there's a lot of really incredible people out there doing awesome urban agricultural interventions. And frankly, like a lot of um, up and coming kind of farmers of color. So like in Detroit and in, in, in New York, there's, there's, there's really inspiring people that are doing good work around food system stuff. Um, and they're both linking kind of broader food system questions to let, let's grow food right here, right now. This is incredibly revolutionary. This is a radical thing to do is to, to sort of take back our food and our health. Um, and I can share I can share some of those with Cameron, and then she can send it out to you all if you're if you're interested. Ron Finley in in L. A. calls him oh, yeah. a gorilla gardener. You know, I love Ron Finley. Yeah, good people doing great work. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we will end it there. On a, that was a very happy note. I think um, we can look to these like urban farmers and try to um, follow in their footsteps and just learn from people who are trying to tackle this issue. Um, and of course, like look to all the solutions that you propose. And I think it definitely has to be like a systemic level um, solution. And I think we can all do stuff. Uh, we can all do something individually to try to help the issue or the problem. Um, so thank you to Professor Lewis for presenting. Um, if you're watching this video, please refer to the comments for details about the giveaway. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and we'll end it here. All right, thank you all. Mm -hmm. Have a good one.